On the Beach 2000. Not to be confused with The Beach 2000, which was a different movie that came out in the same year. On the Beach 2000 stars Armand DeSanti and Brian Brown. The Beach 2000 stars Leonardo DiCaprio. It's an American hit. When I googled On the Beach 2000, I was constantly hitting up against reviews of The Beach 2000. I do wonder if that affected their sales. Spoiler warning, I'm going to talk about lots of scenes in this movie. If you watch this, you will probably be spoiled. It's taken me a while to come to this one. This is partly because we've had Christmas and the New Year and I've been busy, but it's also because I have a lot of thoughts. They're all coming from different directions and I've been trying to find some common thread to use for this video. I think I know what I think. That's where I stand. The trouble is, or the trouble begins for me, in that this movie is a remake of the 1959 movie. It's a bit like Chinese Whispers. This movie is not an adaptation of the book at all. I honestly am not sure whether the people who made this movie even read the book. So I don't think it's really appropriate to analyse this movie with respect to the book. That was my first struggle when watching this movie. This was a made-for-TV movie. It ran across two nights. Part one is about one and a half hours. Part two is about one and a half hours. The total is somewhere around three hours, ten minutes. This gave them a lot more scope for building out the story, building out the characters, fleshing out some of the features that were glossed over hugely in the previous movie and to some extent were glossed over in the book as well. Some things I thought it did really well. On the whole, I feel that it missed the mark. This is not in relation to the original book or to the 1959 movie. This is just taking it as a standalone movie. I feel dissatisfied. And this is colouring my thoughts a lot. This is making it hard for me to look at the movie in the way I wanted to. So here goes. It's the same storyline, it's the same five characters, it's the same events. There's been a nuclear war in the north, radiation is filtering down to the south. The five characters have only months left to live. They get a mysterious signal from the north, there is a mission in the submarine to the north to find out what's going on, after which they all come back and die. Now, this video is the third in my series of three, the first being about the book, the second being about the 1959 movie. I'm not going to go over the same ground, except where these guys have a different interpretation. And I will say here, I didn't hate this movie. I enjoyed watching it. I did hate some of the things that happened in it, but I didn't hate the movie. I will probably get it out in the future and watch it again. It certainly had its good moments. But I am going to be critical about parts that I think did not work. This movie was made in the year 2000. This is 40 years after the previous version of this movie, well, 41 years, 43 years after the release of the book. We're in a very different time period. We've got very different technology. I went and looked at reviews. Pretty much everything I could find was user-based, which is fine, which is better in many ways. I was really just watching them to see if they thought what I thought or if there might be something I missed in my viewing. I've now watched the movie a few times with some of those user reviews in mind to see if that changed how I took it. What I learned is that everybody is just as confused as I am. The people who loved it the most loved it because of the concept which obviously isn't original to this movie some people were fans of specific actors in it and the rest they saw all sorts of things in it and when some people asked questions other people answered them and said try watching the first version a lot of the answers are in there so i guess that makes this a movie for people who have already seen the original and like the story so much that they just want to see another version of it 
And for people who had no clue whatsoever, hadn't heard of either the previous movie or the book and were coming to it as a completely new idea. I've thrown so much time into this already with the book and the 1959 movie that I'm not coming from the same place as anyone else. I had to discard everybody's thoughts and go back to my own. So to start this video, here are some stray thoughts that I need to get out of the way before I tackle this properly. This movie is in colour, the previous one was black and white. I saw a fair few comments hating that. Not the fact that it was in colour, but the fact that it was in vivid colour. It came across as a sort of holiday movie with beautiful oceans and bright green forests. Everybody's wearing year 2000 colours. I didn't have any issue with that myself. I feel like that fits with Shoot's original theme. There were a lot more scenery shots of Australia. This movie was an Australian production, directed by Russell Mulcahy. So I had high hopes for it because Russell Mulcahy directed many of my favourite music videos from the 1980s. It's a name that I grew up with. It's somebody who I've always admired. Not that I'd seen any movies that he did, just the music videos, but he did a great job there. So I know how he does it. I know how he likes to do a lot of colour and a bit of action and a fair bit of metaphor. He is fairly good at narrative, at least in the music video format. He was very good at creating a little story. I was interested to see how this one would turn out, if it would show any glimmer of the moods and the attitudes that I used to get from those videos. Being an Australian production, it has a majority of Australian actors. I saw a lot of people saying that that was a good point. I feel like it should have been a good point. I thought I would like that, but I didn't. I was very surprised to find that they were Australian actors. The way they talk struck me like the way people talk when they're trying to put on an Australian accent. Nobody I have ever come across in all my years of living in Australia. Being Australian, I have never heard anybody talk like any of those people. The accent that they had, the way they spoke, I have never heard anybody speak like that. Outside of the very heavily constructed world of Australian soap opera, where they also have that kind of exaggerated nasal tone. It's not real, and I don't see why it's in this movie. When you would think that the more real you could make your characters, the better. Particularly Julian Osborne, who was acted by someone called Brian Brown. I found his voice particularly hard to listen to. We've got a shift in the main character again. In the book, the main character was the passive Peter Holmes, an Australian naval officer with nothing to do now that the war is over. In the 1959 movie, the main character was Dwight Towers, the captain of the American submarine who has escaped into Australian waters. In this movie, it was very much Julian Osborne, which I would have thought was a good thing because I really liked Julian Osborne in the book. He was John Osborne there and I really liked him. Fantastic character. I did not like what the 1959 movie did to him. I don't think this movie ever was aware of the original John Osborne. What this movie did was take Julian Osborne from the 1959 movie and make him even more extreme. I'm not even sure if he was meant to be the main character in this movie or if it's just that Brian Brown is such an over-the-top actor that he made it about himself. He's a very flamboyant character in this. He's very loud. He's very in your face. He's a colourful character full of energy, which is an absolute perfect contradiction to John Osborne in the book but he is so much more energetic and more vibrant than any of the other main characters that he just kind of steals the attention and the camera seems sort of stuck with him fairly often too. I almost wonder if when they started filming this they were kind of open about who was going to be the main character and they just wanted to see how they looked on the screen and how the chemistry fell out and then they just sort of followed the one that shone the brightest. And that happened to be Julian. The most obnoxious, annoying, self-centred a-hole in this movie. 
at the same time, he was the most sympathetic. If anybody actually had some sort of character arc in this, it was him. He did change a little from start to finish. But while he was a very, very bright, vivid character in this, he wasn't really believable in his role as a scientist, as a mathematician who was the only one who really understood supercomputers. None of that gelled with his hard-drinking, antagonistic ways, his utter lack of ethics. He was an interesting character. He was just kind of playing the role he wanted to play, I think. He wasn't seeing it. Nobody was seeing that in any kind of greater scheme, in any kind of overall theme. This is a minor point, but I'm having issues with the way they've aged up the characters. The actors who played Dwight and Julian in the 2000 movie are both in their 50s. The actress who plays Moira is in her 40s. The actors who played Peter and Mary are both in their 30s. All of them are much older than the characters. I think this only happened because the 1959 movie wanted certain actors involved, certain big names. The 1959 movie was much more guaranteed as a hit if it had actors like Fred Astaire and Ava Gardner in it. And it didn't really hurt the story to age up the actors like that, except that... Neville Shute's characters were young. Neville Shute has written a whole lot of books. They're not all about young people. Even in On the Beach, he had older characters. He had, for instance, Bill Davidson, and he had John Osborne's uncle. But because the story was about the end of humanity, it does have more impact if you're viewing humanity as being a young species, a species that perhaps hasn't even reached its prime yet and they've accidentally destroyed themselves in their greed and their thoughtlessness. And I think for that reason he had these young characters in it and it was even more impactful that they were all dying because they were showing themselves to have a lot of promise. They were just starting out on their walks of life. They hadn't really found themselves yet but they were clearly skilled people who were going to be something, who had the potential to do something good for humanity and they never got the chance. And there's a subtly different feel, a different tone to the movie when the actors are aged up, when you've got middle-aged people who one can presume have already lived that life. And I hate to say that because I feel like ageism is such a destructive Western construct. If you're middle-aged, you've got as much productive life ahead of you as you have behind you. You have as much capacity for inventing, for creating, for furthering the field of human knowledge as you had 20, 30 years ago. So part of me is very conflicted even bringing forward this point, but I feel the difference. I feel the difference in the tone, especially since... The 1959 movie came out at a time when youth was very much prized in a culture, in an American culture, where youth is very much prized still. To have older actors very much sends a different message to the viewer. It's kind of a minor point. They could have come around with it. But when you watch them, you do expect, even accepting that they're too young to die, their time isn't over, you do look at them and think, well, you have already lived a bit. You have already got to do some of these things. So to have Moira, for instance, angsting over the fact that she never got to do what she wanted, you look at her and think you're in your 40s. Like, what have you been doing with your life? Now, there are very good reasons why you can get to that age and not have done what you really wanted. Everybody matures at their own time. People end up in bad situations which hold them back. And one might say that being jilted practically at the altar, is one of those situations that might have held her back for a few years. But it does lack the impact of the young people in Shoot's novel who just hadn't had their chance. So they are a couple of the isolated points that I wanted to bring out before I go into something more structured because I don't really know how to place those impressions within the greater theme of this video. But they had an impact on me, so I needed to say them. On with the rest. 
Dwight Towers in this, he was played by someone called Armand Asante and I have never seen him before. He is, I believe, a genuine American actor. He was great. I really liked him in this movie. He was more the sort of Dwight Towers that I thought the previous one should have been. His role was something of an improvement of the 1959 Dwight Towers. I thought he looked correct and the way he behaved, at least in the early part, he was more of the commanding officer. He seemed more in control than the 1959 Dwight Towers. I do think the book left scope for him to be this very person. It just didn't really explain it that much. Maybe Neville Shoot didn't think it needed to be fleshed out in that way. I found him completely believable in the first three quarters of the first half at least. In the second half, I feel like he went well astray and ruined everything. But at the beginning, I liked him. He did a lot of things right. Rachel Ward as Moira Davidson. Rachel Ward was definitely based on the Overgardener portrayal. So I almost wonder if that was why they decided to do this movie because Rachel Ward maybe wanted to play that role and she was very good if you're just looking at the 1959 movie and you're thinking about this as a remake I do think she improved on that role and she was more Australian and her accent was a little better a bit more natural given the Moira role of the 1959 movie she was fairly faithful to it those who have watched my video about that will know that I didn't like that role and that I very much missed the Moira from the book I still miss the Moira from the book but I don't feel like I can criticise this movie for that because I don't think these people ever, ever read the book. I've already talked at length about Julian Osborne, so I won't repeat it all here. His is the biggest change from the book character. I very much liked the book character, so I'm still a bit salty about a change that I don't see the point of. Putting that aside... There's a lot to like about Julian Osborne in this movie. He is very colourful. He is very active. He does turn out to be right at the end of the movie, although in my opinion that wasn't earned. He has some very funny moments. He is a lightening element in this movie. There's no cloud of impending doom over this movie the way there is in the book, and there's no melancholy sadness in this movie the way there is in the 1959 movie and in large part this is because of the combination of Julian and Moira who are both bright bubbly people. If they had spent more time on the greater things that society had to offer, the things that it is a real tragedy to lose, then Julian's role would have made a fantastic contrast. But all we actually saw of society was people smashing up bottle shops to get at the alcohol and scaring innocent horses in the street. As it was, there were no darker aspects in this movie. They had nothing to counter, so it just seemed a bit over the top and unnecessary. The final two characters, Peter and Mary, the 1959 movie left them very much the same as the book. They were the two characters that I felt hadn't really changed. They'd been brought across quite naturally. That's what I first thought, but actually Peter is quite different. It wasn't until I'd watched it a few times before I realised that. He is a naval officer. He's a fairly quiet character. He is well presented. He is punctual. He doesn't seem much difference on the surface but if you look at Peter Holmes across the first 10-15 minutes of the 2000 movie just look at what he does. For one thing he has opinions. He has opinions when his wife turns up with all her plants and he's saying to his daughter how they've got hardly any petrol left and here she is wasting it. The original Peter never voiced an opinion. He had no opinions. He was opinionless. That was intentional. He had no opinions. This Peter has opinions. This Peter is looking into the future. This Peter is active in a way that original Peter was not. Original Peter was very passive and 1959 Peter was also very passive. So after that scene, Peter goes into town where he faces up to some rioting teens and stops a runaway horse. Now that is something Peter would never have done. 
Peter was not a thinker. Peter did not act on his own part. Peter was no kind of hero. Peter has changed beyond all recognition. The final character is Mary, who I do think in essence she's the same. She is an architect now that fits for 2000. They've made the child a little bit older. It doesn't really hurt. It does remove from that original premise of it's been two years since the bombs went off and after the bombs went off and they knew the world was doomed, they still chose to get pregnant with a child and give birth to a child and bring a child into a doomed world. That message has been completely lost because she is now two years old, so they already had her before the bombs dropped. But I don't see that as a major issue given all the other changes they've made. They've altered the type of story altogether. Mary being an architect, that makes sense. She's far more proactive around the house. She is still very home-driven. She is still looking into the future. I actually like the way they've made her susceptible to all these theories, propositions that radiation isn't going to come here because I do think that's what Mary would have done. She would have found those people out there who said those things. Mary and confirmation bias work hand in hand. Of them all, she is the one that's the closest to the original. And on the whole, I feel that she was a good actress too. There was a couple of points where she had a big emotional moment and it just absolutely didn't land. But on the whole, she suited her role. She did a good job. Their house has changed beyond recognition though. Instead of being tenants in a little flat, they are now in their own quite large two-storey house, which she is renovating. Once again, this isn't necessarily important. In a way, it works because it gives them more to have lost. They really did have it all and they really did lose it all. I just noted. So that's the five characters. I think the changes made to them shows even further that this movie didn't have Shoot's book in mind at all, didn't have the notion of automatons or deniers just trundling through when they could be getting their act together and trying to save themselves. It really is just correcting what they presumably saw as flaws in the 1959 movie. That movie didn't have those things either because it was close enough to the book. Most people had read the book and some factors about the world you would just know because you were alive at that time. More explanation was required to make this a believable scenario in the year 2000. They did a great job achieving that. And for that reason, I feel that they didn't read the book. They just saw those early passive characters and thought it was a failing in the original work. So they've spiced them up. They've given them agency. They've given them moods. They've given them a survival instinct, which it was Shoot's message that we had no survival instinct. So with that message gone, what is the point of the film? I was watching it in those early minutes with all that in mind, thinking, okay, they have removed the premise. What are they going to replace it with? Especially when you're following Peter into Melbourne and there are riots and there are stories on the news about refugees trying to come in from the north and being held back. They've brought the military in to stop them shifting from states. And why? We don't have that original premise that they were staying put. Fair enough. If that's not there, they're going to do this. They're going to try to save themselves. They're going to come south. But why are we trying to stop them coming in. We've got months to live. We've got lots of room. At the end of this movie, people are starving. In the last days of Melbourne, there are people fighting over food in the street, which is sort of a nice bit of cinematography, I suppose. It gives a bit of dystopian feel to it. It makes no sense. I mention it now because all those people, as I said in my last video, all those people up in the north could have brought all their food down. We had a whole lot, especially if we're moving it to 2000, the massive numbers of department stores that we have up there loaded with product. It could all have come down. But maybe I'm jumping ahead. I took many, many notes as I watched this movie and I'm going to talk about that. I'm not taking this whole movie like this. I'm once again, I just feel the setup is so important that I need to focus on it. This movie starts with Dwight, and I did think at this point he was a brilliant character. I really liked him. I really liked the command he had over his ship 
and his men and the relations they seem to have with each other. That worked really well. I like the way he looked too. That looked pretty much how I imagined Dwight looking in the book. They have changed the name of the submarine. It is now the USS Charleston. I don't know why. I guess it doesn't matter. They just all seem to want to put their own personal touch on that. Fair enough. It is now the Charleston. This movie opens just like the last one did with Towers on his submarine finding out that radiation is up north, coming to the southern hemisphere and realising that there is no radiation anywhere. They learn almost immediately that there are a matter of only weeks to live. So this is another big change. They have reduced this time frame from three years down to just a couple of weeks. So I guess in that case it doesn't matter that Jennifer is two years old now rather than a five month old baby. Either way, she was born before events went down. They now only have months to live. Why not? It's turned into something of an action movie and you need that ticking time bomb. In Singapore, people are already dying. This reduced time frame does create a different scenario. This perhaps explains why there would be anger against the Americans, why there would be looting in the streets. The Australian government asks them to collect Julian Osborne from some island where he's choosing to see out his final days. Given that Julian Osborne in the movie, he probably would go to a tropical island and spend the last few weeks in an alcoholic haze. But I don't see what that added to the story at all. I don't see that there's any kind of plot relevance to this tropical island that he's on. I think it's just so that he could be introduced before the others. In the book, John Osborne is the last of the five to be introduced. Everybody else has already met and we've seen them meet in the pages before John Osborne comes on the scene. So given that he is the main character of this movie, I guess it does make sense and that was a way to achieve it. They picked him up off a desert island. He came in on the submarine with Towers and all the others. He is more of a computer scientist now than the sort of scientist that John Osborne was. I guess that's fitting. I'd have to ask why they had to change him in the first place, but I do see, I'm going to say it all the way through this video, this movie knew nothing of the book. This movie doesn't even know that Julian Osborne was ever John. They just made Julian Osborne from the 1959 movie a more vibrant character. I think that was a good call. If that's all you knew, if you only knew the 1959 movie, that's a fair call to make. This is the same character as that, just a bit ramped up. Julian Osborne is introduced very early on. As I said before, I'm really astounded that he's genuinely Australian with an accent like that. It sounds fake. So Osborne in this is bitter and anarchic. The 1959 movie did the same thing. They made Julian quite angry and obnoxious. The role of Moira in the book. I kind of see it more there because 1959 America was very set on certain gender roles. Anger and bitterness was probably not deemed to be feminine enough. But we don't have that kind of hang up in Australia. We have our angry, bitter women. So why didn't they leave Moira to be that person? The answer has to be, that's not how Ava Gardner Moira was. They were updating Ava Gardner. They were not updating Moira Davidson herself. I'm not going to say this every single minute that this was not the message of the book. We know it. I can move on. Julian now performs book Moira's role. We've got refugees flooding down from the north. This was different to the 1959 movie where they actually faced their fate with some hopelessness. Government message is exactly the same. Stay put, stay in your homes. There's no point coming further south. And then we move on to Peter Hongs. Peter has opinions. As I said before, he's a different kind of character. There's a fair chance his wife Mary wouldn't have married him if he'd been a person who had them. Mary... A very good update, for sure. Jennifer, maybe a year older. Anger against the submarine crew, I I think that probably had to go in here. People would have been angry. I hate to think that we're like that, but I think that that actually makes sense. 
Melbourne City. We've got Peter coming into the city of Melbourne and there's the burning skyscraper. That bugs me. That really does. I guess it's a little thing I should just move on. But why? Why? Especially since the camera actually pans in on that. What is the point? What does that mean to this movie? Australia was functioning perfectly. Australia was self-contained. Melbourne had its own fire crew. Melbourne had electricity. There was no reason why. I guess there was a lack of diesel for fire engines. So to that extent, there would have been a slightly slower response, but everything had shifted to steam. It did give this sense of dystopia and society beginning to fall apart. So to that extent, it was a good moment. Ah, yes, and my next point was that there was no steam. Now, in the 1959 movie, in the book, everybody did just bring out their steam engines. Steam engines are still everywhere today. Every museum has a couple of steam-driven stationary engines that they wheel out at the local show as a display. It was a very interesting addition where they had these cars that had been converted into horse-drawn vehicles, so they have people sitting there on their car seat as if they're driving a car but they've got horses pulling it that I guess shows a bit of ingenuity it was a nice visual touch it maybe doesn't make sense but I didn't have too big a drama with that I did have more of an issue with the fact that cars are suddenly like 1940s cars I wouldn't be surprised if somebody involved in the making of this movie was into classic cars and they were a member of a car club and everybody just wanted to get their fabulous cars in the movie so they all brought them out in the streets. But what sense does that make? I mean, if we're lacking petrol, it's not going to improve anything to pack away your 1998 car and pull out your 1947 car. So that didn't make sense to me it did create a sort of an aesthetic of society is beginning to regress because of the events because perhaps we can't get petrol anymore and a lot of imports are failing from the north society might be and I think that's the sort of thing that Russell Mulcahy would do because he did like that kind of metaphor so I could see him bringing in classic cars to express that but while it's an interesting visual effect Narratively speaking, it makes no sense whatsoever. And after all this, I got really excited because the radiation creep was back. At this moment, I thought, yes, yes, this movie is hitting all the beats. This movie is capturing everything we need to capture, except for the characters. We've got this fancy screen showing stage one, stage two, showing where it is. And I thought, this is great. We've got it. They needed this. That is an important part of the movie. Unfortunately, it never comes up again. It was a plot line that they showed it once, they dropped it. And I think, same as I felt with the last movie, it needed it. I suspect they dropped it because it wasn't a major part of the previous movie at all. But being such a big point in the book, I would have liked it if they'd caught that back. They had a perfect opportunity. They could have put it up on LCD displays across the city. Everybody could have known where we were at. It could have come up on the television, but it didn't. Peter didn't realise that we'd nearly reached stage two until he saw that map in the naval office and then he went home and told Mary and she'd been on the internet researching all the theories researching radiation how is it that nobody had posted a picture of that map nobody had the map of the stages right peter and julian already know each other this is because mary and moira are now sisters i guess it works i mean why not the backstory between these four australian characters is pretty huge We've got Mary and Moira. Mary's married to Peter. Moira was going to marry Julian, but he ran out on her two weeks before the wedding. So there's a lot of animosity between Moira and Julian. At this point, Julian wants her back. She's not interested. And then she meets Dwight. So we've got the same love triangle happening again. Only ramped up a million times. And through this movie, there definitely is way more chemistry between Moira and Julian than there is between Moira and Dwight. I said that about the last one. It's still the case because Julian now has the personality that Moira had in the book 
And Moira has changed and become sort of like an older, more jaded, sad woman rather than bitter and angry. But she's still similar enough that, yeah, those two are kind of like minds. So Julian and Moira, they just look like they belong together in so many ways. Now, I know everybody points out that the actors who play Julian and Moira in this Australian movie, 2000 movie, are actually a married couple. You see that quite often. But for a good actor, that's not going to matter. If they're not acting the role of husband and wife, that should not matter at all to us, the viewer. We don't need to know that. That shouldn't count. It's just that the way they created the character of Moira in the movie, her personality better matches the character of Julian. I absolutely don't see why she was even attracted to Dwight Towers, except that initially he kind of thwarts her. He isn't interested and maybe there's a bit of peak there. But why if they've only got weeks left? Why are they even thinking like this? The Australian military are expressing more faith in Jorgensen's hypothesis. It's no longer Jorgensen, it is now Nordstrom. Nordstrom is an old gentleman. We actually meet him on screen. I like that. And he is a more rational character. His theory is a bit out there. Julian is very critical of it. Without, that really annoyed me. Setup was an enormous part in the original book and the 1959 movie. I feel it had its flaws, but it did pull through this initial concept. It did lay it out quite nicely. They did it differently. They actually brought the signal business back. So even at this point when they're setting up the mission, they didn't have much confidence in the mission, but then they got the radio signal and I thought, wow, maybe there is something going on. That is a much stronger basis if you're not going to go with Shoot's original idea, which is just that they were clutching at straws, but they had this unlimited fuel supply because the submarine was nuclear powered. That fact never comes up here. I don't know if we're supposed to just glean that. Without that detail, it seems like they're wasting a resource they don't have, that they might be getting together all the petrol they have to go on this fruitless mission in reality, this submarine being nuclear powered could go constantly for months and months and months. It was the only viable transport they had left. This scene is very disappointing. It's actually very important because this theory of Nordstrom is the plot. This is the main plot of the movie. This is the reason the whole of the second half of the movie happens. Yes, they pick up the radio signal and investigate, but in this version of the movie, in the 2000 movie, they don't know about that at this point. All they know is that Nordstrom has come up with a theory that radiation might be less in the far north. So they're going to go and investigate. So if Julian actually thinks that's a crackpot theory, which is what he says, it's a crucial point. His rebuttal is the other side of the argument that we, the viewer, are going to judge the movie against. This is the scene in which we, the viewer, find out what the story is going to be about. This scene frames the whole problem for us. This scene tells us what the conflict is going to be in this movie so that we can watch it unfold as we go through and understand what is going on as it is resolved near the end. Every movie, every book, every narrative has this event in it. This is like the scene in Lord of the Rings where Gandalf tells Frodo that the ring used to belong to Sauron and has to be destroyed for the sake of the world. The scene in Legally Blonde where Elle realises that she has to study law if she wants to win back Warner. Every movie, every story has this scene in it where we learn as the newcomer on the scene, as the viewer, we learn what's really going on. We learn what this movie is going to be about. Viewers are not passive. If we're truly passive, there's no point in watching it. We'll turn it off halfway through. We won't be interested in the end. We won't feel any engagement with it whatsoever. 
The engagement comes now when we learn what the stakes are, what the conflict is, and we decide whether we are interested enough to follow it through. Part of that is usually, as a viewer or as a reader, we'll form our own opinion at this point. We might not have the information that the characters do. We might not think the way they think. But as the viewer, we've been given enough information that we can come to some uninformed conclusion based on these first impressions, which way we think it's going to go. And we'll be watching for evidence that we're right or that we're wrong. That's kind of how a narrative works. It's a fun game as we go through finding those clues to see, were we thinking the same way? Did we interpret the beginning of this book or movie correctly? And if we did, we're more likely to stick it out because we understood. We understood the scenario. We understood the conflict. So that's this scene. And this scene is doing two things. One is it's framing the whole story for us so we know what's going to go forward from this point. So we know what our characters are striving towards. And it is also establishing the credentials of Julian Osborne, the mathematician. It's at this point that we figure out, is he a charlatan? Is he an intelligent man? Is he really seeing more clearly than the people around him? Are they blinded by hope whereas he is a realist? Or is he just a useless bigot getting in the way of everyone? If he had pulled out a single fact to support his own ideas, to show that he actually has some clear thought in his head other than, I don't want to believe this, we could get behind him as a character. This is the exchange. Nordstrom says, show me one place where those equations don't work, which is reasonable. And Julian replies, they don't get anywhere near to modelling the real complexity. And he can't come closer than that. He says that Nordstrom's underestimated the time frame by a factor of 100 to 100,000, which is no argument at all. All he's saying there in different words is that it's going to take a lot longer than you're saying. There is no rebuttal whatsoever. Not so much as a technobabble rebuttal, which I wouldn't have been satisfied with really, but it would actually have sufficed. So here they are with the most important scene in the movie and they fluff it. They fluff it completely. And I think this is one of the big problems with this movie. It took me ages to figure it out. It's a very watchable movie. The characters are quite engaging. The little scenes that you see piece by piece are quite engaging, act after act. Each one in its own little microcosmic state is very, very watchable, quite entertaining. They are fairly competent actors. It's colourfully put together. It's a nice film. And so it took me ages to figure out what was wrong and why I was so dissatisfied at the end. But this is a big part of it. The failure to set up this scene now has caused a lot of problems for this film. And I'm not even sure if they realised that. Somebody somewhere had this idea of what the beats of a movie are and tried to fit them together into this film without taking into account what the film was actually about which probably made it very hard for the actors themselves to figure out what they were trying to present to us, what little clues about their interior motives they should be putting into their presentation. I don't know. I don't know if maybe I'm just thinking too deeply on it. I did for a long time think, and I was going to say this in here, that the movie strikes me more like a soap opera than an actual movie with a beginning and a middle and an end. It comes across as it just goes on and on an action follows another action and the previous one doesn't seem to have any impact on the later one it's just every day they get up and something happens and that does happen to us in real life but we don't make movies about our real life a lot of these actors did come through television programs which were if not actual soapies were very soapy like to me they actually come from genres that I have never really watched. I do like a strong sense of progress in my stories. But that's actually why it has that soap opera feel, that feel of we've just put some cameras on the wall and we're watching a bunch of randoms go through their final days. It's because this scene doesn't work. Whether in this meeting, in this naval office with Nordstrom and we're watching Julian completely fail to explain why he doesn't agree. Who are we meant to get behind? 
Are we meant to trust in Nordstrom at this point? As it turns out, at the end of the movie, Julian is right. But he shouldn't be right just because he's a belligerent, obnoxious idiot. We can't get behind that. That's not satisfying. That's not meaningful. That is not useful in any way to the story, to any of the characters, not even to himself. There's a supercomputer on the submarine. Fitting. It's 40 years later. There's going to be computers. And in the year 2000, they were really big on supercomputers and all the amazing things that could be done with them. I kind of like that. That's kind of both an update and it's dating it at the same time, given that we're 20 years further on again. And then we meet Swain. I liked Swain here. They've made him charming. That was a good move. They've made him so much more personable. I do like the way in this movie we learned more about the members of the crew. I feel like they would have, especially when they went on that big mission. In the book, it was two missions. In each of the movies, it was one. That's fair enough. They don't have as much time. But during that time, you would expect that they would get to know some of the crew at least. I do think in both the book and the first movie, there was a sort of division in the crew between the officers and the general seamen. And look, I don't know my military terminology and I don't really know my shipping terminology all that well. But I do know that there were sort of general enlisted men, people, and there was the officers. And... In this year 2000 movie, they seem to be like mixing among each other much more than they did in the other two, which has mixed results in this movie, but it does mean that we get to meet some of the people a little more, and I like that. So we have our first reference to the radio signal plot because the signals officer on the submarine was under orders to start monitoring radio signals in the northern hemisphere he questions this he says are you sure did i hear this correctly you want me to monitor these signals up there where nobody's alive and it was confirmed yes yes captain towers wants him to do this so he begins being a dutiful officer and miraculously they discover this radio signal it's a very different approach because we're many years later. I do think they've got a bit of a conflict here between the fact that they've got a working internet and yet they're getting this signal that nobody anticipated finding that seems to have come out of nowhere and then vanished. Of course, we do still have satellites up there in the year 2000. We've got satellites and we've got a fibre optic cables through the ocean, we'll have copper cables, communications is vastly improved, but I would be thinking that the internet won't last long. I would be thinking firstly that in the year 2000 much of the internet was controlled by the northern hemisphere pretty much by the major powers and if there's just been a war, the bombs were dropped, so there's just been this big war it wouldn't still be an open internet. There would be a lot of encryption. There would be a lot of restrictions on what you could do and who you talk to. And an internet doesn't actually just function without maintenance. I mean, an internet is like satellites do transfer signals, but the storage space involved in all the data that's out there on the internet is not up in those satellites. It's all over the world. So I'm kind of surprised. I mean, yeah, local area networks would function. But I guess I'm getting bogged down in that. It sort of seems a little thing. I did wonder at the time and fair enough. To make the story work, let's just go with that. We've got a functioning internet. These events have only just happened. Chances are maintenance wouldn't have been required yet, especially if we assume that all the hackers and trouble people out there in the internet were in the northern hemisphere and they're all dead now because who in Australia would do such a thing but given we might have a working internet how is it that nobody has monitored for signals before and shouldn't they take into account that no signals have come through the internet via email or similar message systems it's just a minor conflict but it did pop into my mind at that point at this point, Dwight is a brilliant character. He is a very good commander. He's energetic on the ship. He's got his eyes on everything. He's just the way I thought he should have been. The first mate is also a real character. This is an excellent idea. 
the two of them obviously ran the ship together. They would have had to depend on each other and they're the most senior Americans left in this one. Of course, in the book they weren't, but in this movie and in the 1959 movie, they're pretty much the only Americans left. So they are the senior people. They're the ones in charge of the submarine. They've been through everything together. They've lost their families. They've got a lot in common. It makes a great deal of sense for the first mate to be a real character. I must admit, after watching him several times for three and a half hours, I actually still don't remember his name, but he was a real character. Made a little note that I recognised Nick Cave's voice in a song. And then we meet Moira. She's the last to be introduced in this movie. So Moira is based on the 1959 Moira. She's in this pub on her own doing this slow dancing with the jukebox not how our original Moira was because our original Moira was just running from her own head she would not have been on her own slow dancing she would have been doing the jive in a dance hall that had a whole lot of other people lots of energy lots of motion lots of voices lots of color so Julian is lying to Moira and I don't like that he's a liar given that he's had that scene where he's kind of laid out what the movie is about. You need to trust that character. The person who's actually presenting the stakes for the viewer to engage with needs to be someone you can trust. Dwight and Moira meet on the train. Nice countryside scenes. This movie did that very well. All the pictures of Australia. It was a beautiful job. The question, where were you? This is one thing that this movie got very, very right. And maybe this is actually where they were going. Maybe this was supposed to be the context for the movie, because that's that's a very good point. That is something that Neville Shute talked about that the 1959 movie did not. Where were you? Why weren't you out there protesting and writing to the paper and talking to your local member of parliament and voting in people that didn't want the bomb. Where were you at the time and what were you doing and how can you now just point fingers at the people that actually pressed the button when the whole world was complicit in this? I do like that that is in here. Then there's this selection business in this meeting about going north. This is really jumping the gun. Now, I know that this is in here for some movie purpose. I think so that we, the viewer, think there's some hope. If we find a safe place at the other end of the world, we've got time to take roughly a thousand people there. Who will we take? It's an utterly pointless conversation to have at this stage. From a realistic perspective, it makes no sense. I would say that you would take the people who show the greater resistance to radiation and who have the skills to recreate society. But from the movie perspective, I see what they're doing. Julian already has a sports car. In the book, owning a sports car was something he'd always wanted to do. And his buying one was an important part of John Osborne's art. One reason he bought it was because it ran on ether alcohol and not petrol. I guess there's a chance that this sports car also runs on ether alcohol. But it seems to be in here more as an illustration of Julian's personality. He doesn't have the sports car because he's taking this opportunity to explore a side of himself that he'd never had a chance to explore. This sports car seems to be nothing but a brag. Moira's Beach House. I didn't like it. I don't know why. The scenery was beautiful. It was a lovely place. I would have quite liked the place like that myself. It would have been a fantastic writer's cottage. And maybe that's one of the things I don't like. She bought it. She says she saw it and she loved it and she knew it was what she wanted. But she only goes there with other people and it's always the wrong person, which makes it sound like she's just bringing her men there. What is the purpose of this cottage? Why did she buy it? I don't see what it's got for her at all. If she was some kind of artist, if she was into meteorology, if she was into paleontology, if she was any kind of subject like that, I'd think, fair enough, you've got this place, I can see why. If she just wanted to come out to get away from people because she's actually an introvert and needs time alone, I would see that too, but she's not. She's clearly not an introvert. 
so I did not find that believable either. Why has she got a beach cottage? It is a beautiful place, though. I agree, it's a beautiful place. And then she brings Dwight to it, and then they sleep together this early in the movie. Another little bit that I've noted here, she's got this phonograph there that came from her grandmother. It's kind of aesthetic, I suppose, but it's another touch like the vintage cars. It doesn't make sense except as a metaphor for the regression of society. I don't like that because actually the fact that society was not regressing, the fact that there was no change in society and life was just ticking over, well, I love that aspect. That was... One of the remarkable contrasts in the book that made their situation so unique. They were about to die. Society was about to be over. And yet everything was ticking over as normal, except that they had no petrol. Things did across the book begin to, to run out. They did start to have trouble finding things. But they never had to regress. And to have a phonograph there with very, very ancient music... That was clearly what they were going for. I have no real reason to complain. That's consistent with the motif of regression. I just felt it needed a bit more explanation. I also didn't see why Dwight would have been so impressed with that. And I can't believe that he would have slept with her so soon either. Also, he told Moira about the mission. This was a top secret mission that nobody was allowed to talk about. I get why Peter might have eventually told Mary. They're married. He trusts her. He feels that she needs to hear this. He wants to give her hope. I get that. Dwight and Moira, this is their first night together. I guess I'm still coming to it thinking of Dwight from the book, who was so honourable, who never put a foot wrong, who did not sleep with Moira because he was married, who never shirked in his duty at all. Why would he tell her? Where is that coming from? It should have had some consequence. If it's in here at all, it should have had a consequence because all it's doing is showing that Dwight is not as upright and virtuous as he presents himself. This scene where Dwight tells Moira something that he's under orders not to tell her, this is the beginning of the new Dwight, the Dwight that doesn't fit. This is the first change. And then we have the car scene. The car scene on the cliff, which is a completely new addition to this movie, that's not anywhere else. It was brilliant. That was the mood of the book. That was the mood of the previous movie. That was just the sort of thing that needed to be here. Even him saying they didn't know, which I presume he's referring to they didn't know that there was some hope because maybe they could have been chosen to be part of that new colony. See, if that had come before he told Moira, it would have made more sense. He could have seen that, he could have thought they didn't know, and then he could have thought to himself, it's actually important for humanity that people do know. He might, perhaps, under those circumstances, have told somebody. It wasn't done that way, it was done backwards. He's already told Moira before he saw these people. But it's a fantastic scene. Then we've got the recalcitrant sailor scene. He's come back to work. There are the two sailors who were shacked up with a couple of women and they're saying, what's the point? What's the point in returning to duty? It's all over. We're all going to die. We may as well just spend the end of our time shacked up with women. And he goes absolutely off at them. Kicks them out. Says, we don't need you here. If you're going to have this attitude, if this is how you feel, get out. I don't want to know. I don't like that, especially since he has just come from that himself. He has just returned from sleeping with Moira. These are his men. He treated his crew like children. He looked after them. In the book, when Moira did come and meet them, he was on alert to make sure she didn't offend them or upset them. It makes no sense that he would suddenly kick them out as if this was just a normal tour of duty and they could go off and join another ship and he could find new crew to replace them. They were family at this point. Because this is getting long, I'm going to race on a bit to the last few things that I very much feel needs to be covered. So, the radio signal. I love the update. I think it works perfectly. And because of this specific update, I see why they had to change the location to Anchorage, which is in Alaska, which is a very cold place. The laptop was fantastic. 
the idea of it being solar powering that allowed the message to attempt to be sent. It worked perfectly. It was mysterious. It explained why they got a few more words each time. I can imagine how that might work. I do accept that when you really look at how a digital signal is sent, there might be a few problems in that. But no, that's close enough. I loved it. It worked fantastically. Given that the bombs had only dropped a few weeks before, I think by the time they got there, it was like two and a half months. And it was in Alaska and that was a very cold place. The amount of decomposition of the body made sense as well. The business of Swain, it functioned pretty much as it did in both the previous movie and the book. He came to his home place, he saw it through the periscope, he decided he wanted to die there, he left the submarine and went fishing. All of that worked perfectly. One thing I didn't like though was the way they tried to foreshadow that with the card scene where he showed himself to be a little bit unhinged. I didn't think that was necessary. I don't see his action as the action of an unhinged man. I think that was a perfectly rational decision by somebody who knew where he wanted to die, who had no doubt at all that he was going to die very soon anyway, and who knew that all his family were dead there. To me, that would have had more power if they had left him as a completely sane person who just chose that death far more heroic. On the note of being unhinged, I do need to talk about the complete annihilation of the character of Captain Towers here. He is a completely ineffective captain on this journey. He should have been removed from command. In one scene, he's there saying, we can't deviate, our orders are to do this, we have to do this. And then two scenes later, he's there saying, no, I'm not going back yet. I want to go and look at San Francisco, I think it was San Francisco they went and looked at. How can you justify that? How can you tell your men, no, we are not deviating, this is our orders and we are doing this, and then just because you want to yourself, you change your mind about that and you decide we're going to go somewhere different. That is not Captain Towers in any sense and I don't think there's any justification for changing it in that way. And the way he behaved on land, the way he was trashing that house, that was absolutely appalling and his first mate ought to have just shot him. It's an absolute miracle he didn't damage his own suit doing that. I lost all respect for Captain Towers after that scene. I'm sure the objective was to humanise him. I don't think that achieved it. I don't think that made him sympathetic at all. It made him a dangerous person to have in charge. He had all those men under his command. They were in danger. And really, they'd taken that fatal early false step in this movie, but up until this point, it possibly was correctable. But once Dwight Towers had turned into that person, that person who could not control himself, Despite all the military training he'd had, all the years he had presumably held a command, all the difficult scenes he had already been through, all of the life he had lived, once he had taken that step and become irredeemable, there really wasn't any hope for the movie. I don't quite know where the people who made this movie thought it was going to lead to have the first mate die the way he did. That death was absolutely 100% on Dwight Towers and it didn't redeem him at all to have him sit by the man's bedside and make him endure all that pain when they had the suicide pills. Not that that's how radiation behaves anyway. That didn't necessarily make sense. But even putting that aside, thinking of this as a narrative beat, there is no coming back from that. Dwight Towers, through his sheer idiocy and self-absorption, killed his first mate and never even seemed to realise it. And another point there is the first mate should have been able to tell him what happened. You've got big problems on your ship if the first mate cannot report an incident to the captain. If the first mate is telling other people on the ship, don't tell the captain. This is not on. This is not how people survive in a perilous situation. 
what did it mean for those two sailors that Dwight kicked out because they stayed with their women and did not report for duty until the first mate went and searched them out? Dwight kicked them out because he needed men he could rely on who would do their duty, who would serve in the way they had enlisted to serve. But he did not do that himself. How can he justify this? How can the movie justify this? How can anybody think you could put that earlier scene in and then have Dwight turn into this cowboy rogue mutineer? What he does in Anchorage is inexcusable. I've seen a few people talk about how unlikely it is that the two most senior officers on a submarine would go on shore themselves in a dangerous situation. That certainly didn't happen in the previous movie or in the book. It was Sunderstrom who went. But you certainly wouldn't expect Dwight to go into a house and just start smashing it up. The bit about the laptop, that was brilliant. It was really cool that they kept the Coke bottle in. That was an excellent tribute to the book and the previous movie. The laptop idea, that was fantastic. Then he does his idiotic smashing up the house bit. Any sympathy I still had for the man was gone at that point. That was not the act of a well-trained captain. He had been through so much at that point. There is no reason to think that he would risk the life of his first officer, that he would allow himself to fall into that state. If he felt it coming on, he would have reported back. That's what any military officer should do. They're well trained for this stuff. They're trained under stress. Of course, stress can break them down, of course. But to do what he did, to go to the lengths that he went to, I know it was supposed to show that he had been feeling some hope and the business of the laptop took away that hope. But that was not an appropriate response. Not in narrative terms, not in real terms. And then we have the incident of the first officer's suit getting torn. And that's really the end. There is no way to redeem Dwight Towers after he has allowed that to happen. And you can't say he didn't. It's because he had his little episode at the house and his first officer stayed with him. And then they had to rush back. That's why it happened. That's why that suit got torn. And that's what effectively killed the first mate. The first officer should have reported that incident in the house to the medical officer and they should both have reported the first officer's torn suit to Dwight. In this movie, it's because Dwight made that call to go and see San Francisco that they lost Swain. So really, from this journey, Dwight has two deaths on his head and I know they're all going to die. They're all going to die very soon. It's only a matter of weeks, but not like that. He's lost control completely. And this is where you do sort of get this interesting switch which makes me wonder what they were trying to do with that earlier scene in the naval office. Because from this time on the submarine, you've got a switch in the good guy and the bad guy. Dwight Towers has become the unhinged bad guy at this point. And Julian Osborne, he just gets better and better here. He's got that really funny thing when... They're saying radiation is getting less. And he's saying, no, you're dreaming. You're imagining it. And this is before they got to Anchorage. And they got the message about the whales have survived. And Julian is saying, this makes no sense. Why would they be talking about whales? And he has that brilliant joke about the pensive wood duck. I really like that. And then he had the even better one about maybe the ostriches have survived too. He did not need to go on and explain that joke. It made perfect sense as it was. I really liked Julian there. That was a fabulous thing. I've made a bit of a note here about iodine, first mate's injury. Why didn't they give him iodine? Which is what they did after Chernobyl. Everybody knew about iodine. They should have had massive stores of it in the year 2000. They definitely should have had stores of it. The business of the orders to return to Melbourne. Dwight says we're ordered to return to Melbourne. A bit empty after his earlier selfishness. The submarine vote, whether to stay or not, I didn't like that. I can see what they were trying to do and I think in a way this was an attempt to redeem Dwight, that he is realising he can't be autocratic, that he's had his dark hour and now he's going to listen to his people and be 
with them more. I do think that's what they were going for. They did not build that up. It was not earned. It makes no sense. Maybe I'm just not in the right mindset, but I do not see what we learned from their decision to return to Melbourne. I don't know why they decided to come back. Was it out of duty? Was it because of Peter, who has a wife and child back in Melbourne, which was part of the argument? What exactly was the message in that scene? What did that show about those people on the submarine? Right, we have the business of the submarine talking to Swain. I actually like this 2000 version better. They did it fantastically with Swain in the boat and them in the submarine having that conversation much better. Then we're back in Melbourne and we've got violence. We've got a lot of violence. It's only been a few weeks. People haven't got it out of their system yet like they had in the book. The first mate sickness. Now my assumption here is while I don't see why they made him go through that. Why Dwight sat by his bedside for days and days when they had a single tablet that could take it all away. I think they did it for us, the viewer. I think that was a way of showing us the effects of radiation so later on when the others took the tablet, we would know what they were avoiding. So I get it. But I can't forgive Dwight for having caused the whole thing. He is not a good person in this. The helicopter. No movie needs a helicopter. Certainly no movie needs a helicopter to be added where there wasn't one in the past. I do think this is just something that people who do movies love the fact that they can access a helicopter and they're going to put it in their movie if they possibly can. It adds nothing and the amount of fuel that a helicopter uses, there's no way they would still have been flying. And then we get to all the death. Julian Osborne, the way he died in his Ferrari, it was spectacular, it was an excellent metaphor and it was a nice way for Julian to go out. Peter and Mary and Jennifer, their deaths were very effective, especially the way Peter turned off the power. It was one of those little things that remind you how hard it is to believe how hard it is to conceive of this situation turning off the power they don't want to burn to death while they're asleep that's how it comes across to me very sad and then we get to Dwight and Moira I read a whole lot about this when I was looking at reviews for this movie so many people hated the fact that he came back to her I don't think he did he came and he saw her and he said, I'm going to die with my men. He went back out with them. They went out to international waters and scuttled the ship, which meant effectively their submarine was America in international waters. They died in America, which is what they all wanted. Now, in the book, that has more relevance because Dwight was an automaton and Dwight just saw himself as an appendage of the machine of America so it was extremely important to him that he did die in America in whatever way he could achieve that rather than in Australia. That element wasn't in this movie so it probably didn't make as much sense for them to be going out in the submarine and just drowning or whatever but that's what it was about it was so they could die in America. And they didn't have to go all the way back to America for it. They just had to leave the shores of Australia. And then we see Moira and her death. That's sort of similar. She died behind the wheel of her car watching the submarine going down the coast because it was the closest she could get to Dwight in the book. It was a very similar death for her there. And regarding the big debate, I've watched this so many times, I don't believe Dwight returned. That was just her fantasy. That was just, she died thinking about him. He was on her, her mind. She imagined him climbing up the shore. That's not the way he would have come. She would have heard the helicopter if he flew a helicopter in. He didn't. We saw her head fall back. Her head fell back, her eyes closed, and then suddenly she's sitting bolt upright again. So I'm pretty sure he wasn't there at all. He died on his ship. Even though Dwight had lost everything that made him Dwight. It was kind of nice to see the whole story ending in the way that it always did. 
for me, one of the most poignant moments is seeing Moira die all alone. So that's the 2000 movie. I don't really have anything particular to say about it apart from that. It's three and a half hours and that's exhausting in itself. It's a little bit too long for me to hold in my head. And it dragged, it lost its way at times. It went into these scenes that seemed more like digressions than actions that furthered the main plot. Watching the movie was a whole lot of little darts into dead-end alleys rather than just traipsing forward like the 1959 movie was. But in its essence, it was the same thing, just a different take. So I'm going to finish this by talking about the title. I didn't do this before because there's lots of stuff out there about this. It's referring to the beach near Peter and Mary's house, where in the book and the first movie, at least, White and Myra meet, and that kind of makes a lot of the action happen because... Moira then sort of chases Dwight and keeps him involved in the group. It's also apparently a naval term, which refers to retirement. Naval officers are said to be on the beach when they're retired. The war is over, so there's a lot of naval officers with nothing to do now. They are all effectively on the beach. And a poem by T.S. Eliot called The Hollow Men, a quote from that poem is the epigraph for the book. I did consider talking about this before, but I thought surely everyone's talked about that, so I didn't. The epigraph of the book is, In this last of meeting places we grope together and avoid speech, gathered on this beach of the tumid river. And then a bit further on in the poem they've put another one, This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. And that was what this was about. Not with a bang, but a whimper. (laughs) 